To study people is uh, the most fascinating study of all studies. Uh, <laughs> some people uh, uh, spend their whole life studying rocks. Isn't that something? Well, there are the others that spend their whole life studying beetles. And a lot of those folks get divorces. <laughs> they can't get a hold of flesh, you see. Um, we are studying a very remarkable person who made his stamp on history and all the natural, all the natural relationships he had uh, said he couldn't. All, all of his natural abilities were not historical at all. And yet something got a hold of him that engraved his name in history. You go through the Vatican in Rome, they've got a statue of this man and so many Roman Catholics have kissed his toe until they kissed his big toe off almost. I mean, hundreds of thousands uh, have kissed his toe. Well, he's the fisherman that we're talking about. Uh, he is the person that had so many problems. And, and 2,000 years later, people are adoring him, you see? Uh, there was something there that maybe the average person won't, won't see. There's some greatness there that maybe uh, if you're not careful, you, you won't get to it. I have met just a few great people in my life. You could name them all on one finger and have a, on one hand, have a few fingers left. But those that I have met, it was difficult to discover their greatness. And, and uh, I saw people that didn't believe they were great. They would say, he is not great because they could not, they could not comprehend greatness. True greatness is not always easy to, to see or to discover. And here was a man that had something. <laughs> I'm sure the other 11 disciples didn't see it. I think they got tired of him. They said, if there's any problems around here, always look for Peter. He's in the middle of it. But uh, we're studying life. Say life. life. The life of a man. Uh, the true story of a real flesh and blood human person. And you that are visiting, this happens to be lesson nine. And so if you're interested in what we have said about this tremendous person called Simon Peter, uh, then you can, you can get eight others beside this one. And we're by no means finished. We're still working on this man. We're trying to get to the bottom of, of something about him that you and I relate to. Possibly we relate to him more than we do any other person in the Bible. We're so much like him. Yes, yeah, some of you don't like that. <laughs> in today's lesson, it's Simon Peter in relation to unbelief. And the unbelief was in relationship to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The biggest thing the Lord ever did was to rise from the dead. And his unbelief was in relation to the biggest thing. <laughs> he could believe for little things, a big thing got him. We're beginning in Mark chapter 16 and verse 9. If you would open your Bibles. Now we have come to the moment of resurrection in the, in the story of the Lord Jesus. It says, when Jesus was risen. Say risen. Risen. When the Lord Jesus had defeated the devil and walked up the staircase of hell with blood on his feet from Satan's head and a girdle around him with keys dangling, the keys of death and hell, with a smile on his face like the summer sun in its glory and walked through the tomb of Golgotha by its side into the golden sunlight of the first resurrection morning and said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. <laughs> and Peter didn't believe it. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? When Jesus was risen, he was risen early. Talk about the early bird getting the worm. If you're not early, you often miss things. Early people always get in on things that the non-early 
Never do get it on. Being late is a habit. It's not a necessity. When you find yourself late three times, you better look inside of you. It's not conditions, it's you. Are you here or not? Jesus was risen early, not on the Sabbath, but the first day of the week, which is your Sunday, which is today. He appeared first. Say first. first. Say it again. First. Say it again. First. It was not. It was not to James, nor John, nor Andrew, nor Peter, nor any of the rest of them. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Now let's look at it just for a moment, please. <laughs> If she'd have been home in bed, he wouldn't appear to her first. Why did he appear to her first? Her virtue? No. He appeared to her first because she was in the right place. People in dead churches are in the wrong place, and I guarantee that to you. It's plain stupidity. We got more sense about gasoline than we have about immortality. We've got a couple of empty filling stations around here, and I'd sure have a strange idea about you if I saw you stuck up in one honking your horn and they hadn't had any gas there for the last five years. <laughs> That's what you do on Sunday morning in some churches. You just honk your horn. There hadn't been anything there for a long time. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to her first because she was the first one there. And then to further identify her, because there are six Marys in the New Testament, he says, this is the one out of, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, if you've got seven devils in you and, and they get cast out, when you're not listening, everybody's talking about your seven devils. Have you already knew that? Yeah. People love to talk about your seven devils. They don't like to talk about their own, but they enjoy talking about yours. It didn't matter how beautiful she was, they'd say, but, but, but. She used to have seven devils. And they may come back, you can't ever tell. How I many of we got people like that still living? Yeah. You can live like an angel. If there's anybody that knows your background, they'll say, hey, hey, but you didn't know him when I did, yeah. But divine revelation said, tell it and tell it all. Yeah. He first appeared not to a man with those beautiful flowing beards, you know, and aristocratic men, appeared to a little woman. Appeared to a little woman. Just want to tell you something. God will bless anybody he wants to and it's none of your business. I went to a place in Goshen and preached and I will never preach there again as long as I live. I got over there and bless you, there wasn't a woman present. Just a bunch of old ugly men. <laughs> I wanted to leave so bad I didn't know what to do. And those birds thought they were better than the women. I said, where are the ladies? They said they're home cooking for us. I, was, I didn't want to say it too strong, but I was hoping to put rat poison in it or something other. <laughs> they wouldn't let those women sit in that meeting. I preached a sermon for the ladies and, and they not a one there. And they felt that they were learning from the Bible that ladies shouldn't be there. Well, Mary Magdalene's gonna laugh at you in heaven till you hang your head. She'll get right up in your teeth and say, do you know who was the first to see the Lord when he rose from the dead? Ha-ha! <laughs> you would have to say of her that, that, that she was the one that had been last and now she was first. Don't worry about where you came from. Worry about where you're headed for. You may have been last a lot of times. You don't have to keep on being last. You may have been behind 
in school and a lot of other places, you don't have to stay behind. They tell me that there were four boys out here at Notre Dame in the law school and that they had their buddies together, four of them. And that one of them was kind of dull, but they finally let him through. His father had quite a bit of money. And they finally let him through and, and, and he got out. And about 10 years later, uh, three of them were, were still in uh, law and had done fairly well. But the, the, the odd one uh, had left law and, and, and uh, in a very strange way had become a multimillionaire. And so when they, they met, they, they knew that he wasn't quite up to them in smartness. And, and they said, you know, uh, we're fairly well off here. We're attorneys, but since you left the law and, and you've become a multimillionaire. So how did you do it? Well, he said, you know, uh, I discovered this little thing here that I could make, uh, you know, for, uh, for 40 cents. And I, I sold it for $4. And says, so everybody began to buy it. And he said, you know, it's just amazing to me how well you can do on 4% interest. <laughs> and those lawyers looked at one another and said, just leave him alone. He's all right. <laughs> Any man that can make millions... It don't matter where he understands interest or not, you know. We're not all clever the same way. They couldn't make the box. He made that, you see. You don't have to remain the tail. God can make you the head. And this little woman was the first that saw him. And then verse 10 says, she went and told them. That was nice of her. She went and told them that had been with him. That was the 11, 11 apostles. Uh, one of them had committed suicide named Judas. She went and told them that had been with him. Read it carefully now. As they mourned and wept. And they'd had three days of it. And their eyes were swollen. They mourned and wept. He had told every one of those men a number of times that he would rise from the dead. And on the resurrection morning, they were still mourning and weeping. I think there's some of us mourning at the wrong time. Mourning when there's already victory. Mourning when there's already blessing. Mourning when we've already won the war. On the resurrection morning, they were mourning and weeping. Now mourning and weeping is a condition of the soul and not the spirit. And so their solical parts were overriding their spiritual parts and they were living in their soul and not living in their spirit. Are you here? Okay. Some people think it's real holy to mourn and weep. Not on the resurrection morning thinking Jesus is dead. It's not. You better keep your eyes open to see what God's doing and, and, and rejoice with what God is doing. God is doing great things now. Say now. Yeah. That's right. Thank God for little Mary Magdalene's that are up, running around finding it too. Verse 11. And they, that's the 11 apostles, when they had heard that Jesus was alive and had been seen of Mary Magdalene, Got the last two words? Believe not. Believed not. Believed not. That she had seen him and they believed not. Now, unbelief is a spirit. And you can let that thing get into you. And, and, uh, and it can cause you to disbelieve when you ought to be believing. Can you say amen? Amen. That was Mark's words. Just look at uh, the, the great physician, Luke. He had words about this in Luke 24 and 10. It says, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. Now, can you imagine little women, all of the women, totally women, having to preach to the apostles? And you had thought they were so great, you know? Look at verse 11. And their words seemed to them as idle tales. I want to tell you something right now. You can believe one day and disbelieve another. 
You can have one faith. One day you can have faith and the next day not have any. You got to keep your faith up to date. It says these 12 apostles, you know, it named them right there in verse 10. And verse 11 says these words of these Christian women were idle tales. And it says, and they believed them not. They believed them not. Some people, if they're not in on it, won't believe anything. And if it was Jesus, I'd have it. Not really. He'll give it to whose heart's open. They saw him because they were in the right place. They saw him because they were right at the sepulcher when he walked through the door. And if you'll get in the place where Jesus walks through the door, you'll see him. But you won't hide off somewhere groaning. Look at verse 12. Then arose Peter, and he ran to the sepulcher. Uh, you, you, you're, you're seeing a good point there. Thank God he ran. He didn't crawl. He didn't walk. Brother, he put speed behind it. He put energy behind it. You say, what in the world does that mean? It simply means that when he says, well, these women have said it. I don't believe it, but I'm going to find out. <laughs> Some of us won't even go find out what God's doing. We just let somebody else tell us. Years ago about the full gospel people, they used to say, oh, those people spit fire. And they climb up walls. You say, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it, haven't you? No, somebody told me. You're an ignoramus is all you are. <laughs> Talk about something you don't know anything about at all. And always be smart enough not to discuss things that you don't know anything about. And, and don't discuss hearsay. The, the biggest bag of lies the devil ever handed out is hearsay about people and about conditions. So don't, don't, don't accept it. Peter rose and he ran. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and he departed. You think he was convinced? Look at the next words. Wondering in himself. He was still in a state of confusion. Now he had had two things. He had seen the grave empty. He had heard the witness and the testimony. And he's still in wonderment. He still didn't know what to do with the situation. He still wasn't sure of what had happened. He was a man. We're getting to see it, aren't we? I have some books that I want to say more about later, I imagine, uh, about the John Wesley family. Uh, I, I have a book written about the whole family. It's about this thick. And everybody ought to read it because you get old John Wesley down to size in there. Boy, his mother and his sisters worked him over. They put faith in his heart. They scolded him. When you get in the whole family operation, John's not the big, bright, and shining star that most people think he was, you know. You find out he was very human and uh, susceptible to mistakes. The greatest mistake he ever made was he married the wrong woman. She beat him. She knocked him. She cussed him. She locked him out on cold nights where he couldn't get in his own house. And his brother told him not to marry her. Some brothers are very smart. I don't know which one it is, but anyway, some are, whoever they are. So many times a great person has still a lot of weaknesses. And so many times the greatness is out of themselves, you know, that it comes from God. And then that's when you have to give God the glory for it. That's when you have to say, hey, isn't God great? Yeah. And I'm sure that we can say that in our own lives. Mark 16, 14, it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he upbraided them. Well, it was about time for a rebuking. He that heard the witness and the testimony. Peter had been down and had a look in there and, and, and saw the, the resurrection. That He wasn't there. The clothes were there, but he wasn't there. And so he upbraided them. He upbraided them for not believing. He upbraided them for having a hard heart. Now, wait a minute. He blamed it on them. He did not blame it on the circumstances. He did not blame it on problems of any kind. He blamed it on them. He upbraided them for their unbelief because they had been told 
and they had been to the sepulcher and it was empty like they said. So he rebuked them for their unbelief and they had permitted their hearts to get hard. I've known of people that have actually lived in a full gospel situation and became total unbelievers later. Just couldn't believe a thing. The other night when you saw the power of the Lord demonstrated all here in the, in the altar part of this church. There could people, be people that saw that and a few years from now have no faith at all. The devil just wiped the whole thing out. To keep your faith, you have to keep it. You have to work at it. And it's not the faith you had yesterday. Now it's the faith you have today. And tomorrow, it'll be the faith you have tomorrow. So Jesus rebuked them. He rebuked them because they hadn't believed a witness that they loved. And a woman that did not tell lies. And an empty tomb. <laughs> they wouldn't believe either one of them. Because their hearts were hard. You say, you're sure that's what he's talking about? We'll read the rest of the verse. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So I'm right, you see. Now, Peter should have believed. He had had supernatural revelation. In Matthew 16, when Christ was coming back into Galilee from from Philippi. He said, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And the disciples, you know, all burping up, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, John Baptist, you know, all kind of junk. You know, those people that work with you always pick up the junk on the perimeter and they'd picked it all up. Jesus wasn't satisfied. So he wheeled around and said, whom do you say I am? Well, he can stop you in your tracks, you know. And, and, and before anybody could say anything, bursting up out of the inside of Peter came those amazing words. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> when he said the, he meant he was the only one. There weren't two or three or four. The Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, one, one, one. And I think the Lord has even taken back a little bit. He wasn't expecting such a good revelation out of such a poor spot. And he said, hey, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father in heaven revealed this to you. And then he said, upon this rock, that was what Peter had said, upon that revelation, I shall build my church there. And the church is built today upon this preposition, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That's what the church is built on. The church is not built on Jonah fish fries. Thank God. That'd be a stinking place to build anything. It's not built on little pink tea parties, gossip parties. It's built on the preposition that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can stay there. It's a Gibraltar. It'll always be there. And that revelation poured forth through this man that his faith had failed him in that moment. You say, why? Well, let's face it. Re resurrection is a truth beyond human comprehension, you see. It's the ultimate miracle. Peter and all the disciples had been told by the Lord of his death and resurrection on Mount Tabor. He had heard Moses and Elijah discuss it with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had heard it. These men had heard it and seen it. And it was Peter that wanted to build three little churches up there. Eeny, meeny, miny. And Jesus said, no more. <laughs> and the voice of heaven said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. And he, he cut off the denominations real quick. So he had had revelation. But here was a, a miracle beyond his functioning of his natural man that shows you these other things were supernatural. And so when we see how great a revelation it was, then we can see what happened after that. This resurrection message became the number one 
the number one truth of their total lives. In Acts chapter 2, you discover that Peter preached it, you know, the, the resurrection. You discover that all the disciples, they, they, they preached it. This became the, the leading thing in their lives. It became the dominant factor of their lives. It became the number one truth that they presented. The thing that was the hardest for them to get a hold of became the number one thing. The all important thing. That's true sometime. The blessing that's the hardest you to get a hold of becomes number one in your life. The truth that you, you, you sought for so hard, so long, becomes the number one truth in your life. How beautiful it is when truth grows within us. Finally, Peter believed in the resurrection. <laughs> I'm really glad for that. Yeah, Christ had to appear to him and rub his nose against his nose, but he finally got through to him. And he became the great apostle, the great preacher, the anointed one, so full of the power of God that even a shadow could heal people. Isn't that something? Even a shadow could heal people. You say, what does that teach you? It teaches you that God can use the one that's, that's not stable and, and the one that doesn't look as if he has any future. God can take that person and make great things out of them. And the only reason the story of Peter's in the Bible is to teach all of us that Jesus Christ is the same today. He wants to use you. He wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you. He wants you to rise up and be more than your natural self and your natural abilities and, 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 and let him bless you. And he's ready to do it right now.